No? Okay, good, good. I think I have a very good sense of uh, what people are interested in. And uh, so let's get started with actually a lot of examples uh, uh, that are related to what you just uh, mentioned. So, uh, well, this is the ancient uh, uh, Chinese character for air, and uh, it pronounced like qi. And yes, it's the same qi as you have heard about. So it also means, in general, things that uh, works but are invisible to the eyes. Right. So uh, we're going to have lectures on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this time over here. And the recitations, I know, like online, it has four slots. But I'm trying to squeeze it to as few uh, slots as possible. So uh, the first proposal is going to be one to two and two to three. Right. So so uh, the recitations are uh, group works uh, uh, either on software or on like uh, hardware. So we are either going to do testing in the wind tunnel, right? Uh, there are small wind tunnels and big wind tunnels, or we work on software and uh, are doing CAD modeling uh, using aerodynamic software to calculate stuff. So it, it really kind of uh, uh, benefits uh, with a smaller setting, right? Uh, if we have uh, uh, 40 people in a room, it's a little bit hard to manage. So uh, I want to split it into multiple sections, but also I don't want to have like four sections uh, in total. So uh, are there how many people cannot make either of these uh, slots? One, two. Okay. And uh, uh, if we push, okay. So so anyway, so I, I'll send a, a survey online, right, uh, to see like uh, if we can find uh, a good set of slots so that everybody can come. All right. Okay. So I'll. Make it uh, DVD. All right. Uh, I'm still looking for a TA, so I'm sure like uh, we'll have a TA pretty soon. And uh, uh, there is a Canvas website, and uh, uh, there is a Piazza website. Uh, also, this notebook is live. So if you go to our Canvas website, uh, I think I can switch to. Uh, yeah, so, so, so if you go to course syllable, and uh, you can actually find uh, the lecture notes link over here. So if you click on it, uh, uh, you can actually see the, so if I, if I write anything on the, uh, on the whiteboard, like on the screen, you can see it immediately updated on your computer too. So, so this, is a, uh, this is a live uh, lecture notes. All right, Piazza is uh, the place you ask questions. When you miss the office hour, you want to ask questions uh, during other times. All right. And uh, uh, my office hours, I, uh, I can either do it uh, Monday or Wednesday immediately after class. Oh, actually, not, not Wednesday, not immediately after, after class. Wednesday, I can do it uh, from 1 to 2. Uh, Monday, I can do it uh, from uh, uh, noon to 1. So, uh, I'm also going to send a survey to see which uh, spot is best for people, right? Uh, and uh, if there are a lot of conflicts, then I can do it like alternative, like one week this time, another week that time also. So uh, I also send out a survey for that. All right. Uh, that's basically the logistics. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, and uh, uh, in the Canvas website, you can also see uh, what are the, how the course is going to be graded. Uh, so let's see, uh, there is homework, uh, especially before, before roughly Thanksgiving, uh, there is going to be a lot of homeworks. It counts roughly a third, slightly more than a third of the grade. The project is going to be what you are going to be focused on after Thanksgiving. It accounts for slightly less than a third of the grade. And there are two quizzes, and uh, the two quizzes combined together is going to count a little bit more than a third of the grade. So it's kind of a third, a third, a third. All right. So uh, the first uh, uh, quiz is going to, I mean, both are going to be in-class quizzes. The first is going to be the Wednesday before the, um, what break is it? Uh, the, the, there is an October break. Uh, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, the second one is going to be the Wednesday before the, uh, not the Wednesday, but I think the, the second Wednesday before the Thanksgiving break. All right. No final exams. And uh, these two quizzes are uh, like purposefully designed to be offset from 
most of your other midterms and finals so that uh, hopefully it'll be a little bit uh, uh, less stressful for you. All right. Okay. Uh, that's it. And uh, you can ask any question anytime. Like, I, I like people asking questions. I, I always think uh, it doesn't really make sense for you to come to class unless you uh, at least uh, have intention to interact because I, I record everything, right? I, and uh, you can see there is no there is no grace that uh, there is no part of the grade that requires you to come to class. So so it, it's fine if you uh, just to watch the recording back at home. But like uh, I would really love people here to ask questions and uh, interact, uh, interrupt me anytime. Yeah, I like it actually a lot better. <laughs> All right. Questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about what we are going to be learning. So. Uh, the whole course is split into four parts. Uh, uh, the first the three parts are mostly lecturing and the labs, and the fourth part is the project. So the uh, three first parts are fundamental concepts that underlies everything, and uh, uh, the second part is incompressible potential flow. So that's kind of uh, the fluid dynamics in the simplest uh, setting, right? And uh, the third part is viscous and compressible flow that introduces a uh, two complications that are uh, that are not important in many cases but uh, important in other many cases and uh, finally uh, we have the team design project that is the topic is, uh, is TBD right we are going to uh, we're going to fix the topic uh, later in the semester and uh, all of these are split into more applied topics and the more theoretical topics. In the fundamental concepts, uh, the more applied topics are understanding aerodynamic forces, right? It's more, it's still pretty theoretical. I, I would say it's not really, uh, it's still theoretical, but not as mathematical, okay? And uh, the uh, flow kinematics and vorticity really starts to involve things like differential equations. Okay, and that's uh, that's uh, the place where you have to use linear algebra, uh, differential equations, and even some uh, partial differential equations, as I'm going to introduce to you. When we are going to incompressible potential flows, uh, the more applied topics, including understanding the shape of airfoils. Again, like airfoils are something pretty unique to... Um, not unique, but like very much more widely used in aerodynamics, right? In aerospace engineers, and uh, uh, that's because this is so far the best thing we found to manipulate large volumes of fluids, right? You can have a very small airfoil in terms of a very small cord length, right? And if you put that small cord airfoil on the wing with a large span, it is actually capable of manipulating the motion of a very large volume of fluid. And in aerodynamics, that is very important. So understanding how you can design the shape of airfoils, how the shape of airfoils affect the motion of flow around it is very, very useful in aerodynamics. And uh, also lift-induced drag, uh, I'm going to really focus on why lift is quite important uh, this week and uh, uh, a very hard to avoid consequence is any lift is going to induce some amount of drag right and uh, we're going to study that and uh, finally aerodynamic stability very important for control right and uh, uh, so we'll focus on that and to understand this we also need to understand uh, a lot of the more mathematical topics potential flow theory Right, that includes actually understanding of a type of partial differential equation that is fundamental, not just to aerodynamics, but to actually many other physical phenomena, like electromagnetism, right, and uh, uh, gravity and other things. Uh, we're going to look into thin airfoil theory. That is probably uh, the pinnacle of uh, the use of calculus uh, in this class, right, and uh, 
it, it, it's not as important that you understand the, or, or you can recreate the whole derivation of the NFO theory, but to get a sense of what is the what is the impact of the derivation to practical uses, right? If you can sense, like if you change the shape of an airfoil in a certain way, according to thin airfoil theory, that will produce certain kind of change in how the flow is going to be around it. That's actually immensely useful. And finally, uh, the dynamics of vortices is extremely important in, in understanding three-dimensional flows. And uh, it actually is very hard to make sense of any three-dimensional flow without understanding the dynamics of vortices, right? And uh, uh, for example, like why an elongated wing is the best uh, shape we can do to manipulate like large amount of fluids. So finally, we get to the more complicated section that is viscous and the compressible flows. So this viscous flow is very important in understanding high lift airfoils and the high lifted devices, right? If you want to, uh, if you want to land something at low speed or take off at low speed, you want high lift. That is high lift coefficient, right? Basically, high lift at a slow speed of motion. So uh, viscous flows, which controls flow separation and therefore controls how much lift you can get, is extremely important. And to understand uh, how that works, you need to understand viscous flows and uh, boundary layer theories, which by itself is actually is a lot deeper than we can cover in this class. And there is an entire graduate cl class on viscous flows uh, in Core 16. And uh, uh, transonic and supersonic flight uh, that touches uh, a compressible flow and shocks. Again, uh, there is a lot more about compressible flow than we can cover. So we are going to just uh, do the fundamentals for us to understand uh, how transonic and super, especially supersonic flight differs fundamentally from the uh, incompressible flow that we discussed in the second part of the class. And finally, aeroacoustics that becomes actually quite important in advanced the modern uh, advance the urban mobility, right? Because if you want things to fly inside cities, right, and you really need to mitigate the noise. A lot of the noise we usually uh, hear are actually from aerodynamic sources due to the motion of air. And of, of course, like to transmit any sound, you need air, right? So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, a lot about unsteady flows. That's uh, uh, something we'll cover. Okay, so, so this is everything we'll do in this semester. And the team design project, uh, uh, hopefully we're going to come up with a topic that utilizes most, if not all, of the topics we're going to cover. Okay, a any questions so far? No? Okay. Yes, please. Um, how much of this is overlapped with the topics from fluids um, from Unified? A lot of them are overlapping with the fluid from Unified, but we'll go deeper in pretty much all of the topics. Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, before, you, before we go too much into the class, it will be very, very nice if you can do a review uh, of the Unified fluids material. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yes? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I I usually uh, I can post a kind of a plan, right? But it's a plan in the sense that uh, uh, if a lecture takes longer or shorter than I expected, uh, I will put some of the materials later or earlier. So so it's not going to be. Uh, it's very hard to predict. Let's say like. Uh, November 1st, we're going to be covering exactly that topic. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's get into the class then. Um, so, I first want to kind of uh, ask you about uh, you, uh, a little bit uh, about a survey, right, of uh, where do we use aerodynamic forces? And the aerodynamic forces are forces due to relative motion between body, like solid body usually, and air, right? 
and uh, uh, I can let's generalize a little bit. Let's say like uh, fluid dynamic forces, right? Where are the important uh, applications or interesting applications about uh, uh, aerodynamic or fluid dynamic forces? Maybe I'll go first. Uh, airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In uh, windmills or hydroelectric plants. Oh, in a windmill and hydrodynamic plants for generating energy, right? So let me actually, I have an example of that. Uh, how does a wind turbine generate energy, right? So that's the kind of uh, aerodynamic forces we use to generate uh, uh, energy from the wind. And one of the things you actually see is that these wind turbine blades are the kind of uh, elongated structures, right? as similar to like a, a wing of a glider airplane, right? And it rotates, although it's very thin by rotating around, it actually manipulates a surprisingly large amount of uh, fluid. So, so let's just uh, look at uh, uh, some uh, fluid dynamic simulation to understand uh, not just the shape of the wind turbine blades, but also the fluid that is manipulated uh, by these wind turbine blades, right? So as you can see, as it rotates around, basically uh, it rotates around at a much faster speed than the wind, right? You can see these uh, uh, tip vortices being advected uh, downstream, and uh, the velocity of the wind that advects these tip vortices is actually much slower than the uh, speed of the blades, right? So, so this is a very good application of aerodynamic forces. And uh, uh, by the way, there are two kinds of uh, aerodynamic forces, uh, lift and drag, right? Do you see that uh, uh, these wind turbine blades are primarily manipulating the fluid, the air, by lift or by drag? Drag? What is drag? What is the difference between lift and drag? Yes? Uh, lift is perpendicular to the relative uh, direction of motion, while drag is parallel to the direction of relative motion. Very good. Lift is aerodynamic forces that are perpendicular to the relative motion between the air and solid, right? And drag is parallel to the relative motion. So in this case, the, uh, the speed, the relative velocity, can almost be indicated by the tip vortices, right? So if you draw a line that's tangential to the tip vortices, that's the direction of relative motion. And let's see, if this is primarily affected by drag, what happens is that the drag is parallel, and in which direction? It's opposing, drag is always opposing relative motion, right? So as the blades rotate in that way, the drag would oppose the relative motion, which tries to slow down the rotation of the wind turbine, right? Which would not help generate energy, right? It's the opposite of helping generate energy. So as opposed to drag, the wind turbines generate energy by lift. So because the lift is actually perpendicular to these tip vortices, and because the tip vortices, they are helical and they rotate slightly downstream, right? The lift actually is primarily points downstream, but it's tilted a little bit. I mean, if you can imagine the helical structure and the lift being perpendicular to the helical structure, it is going to be tilted just slightly towards the direction of rotation, not opposite. The result of that is that a very tiny component of the lift not only overcomes the drag, but also forces, also feeds the energy of the generator and generates all the electricity that a wind turbine generates. Right. Okay. So anyway, so being able to visualize 
the fluid, how the fluid moves around it, the relative motion between the solid and fluid is very important in understanding, for example, how wind turbine works. So that's a very good example. Any other examples of aerodynamic or hydrodynamic forces uh, with interesting applications? So I took the easiest one, right? Yes? The wind turbine. The, the, sorry, not the wind turbine. The, the, the wind tunnel, that's the one. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the wind tunnel, right. The wind tunnel. The wind tunnel is actually a very interesting uh, device. Uh, actually, we should be able to tour the wind tunnel. Uh, I, I'm still scheduling uh, one of the Fridays, right? Uh, so, so we should be able to tour the wind tunnel like uh, during one of the uh, Friday afternoon sessions. The wind tunnel works because there are something that drives the airflow, right? So what, what is driving the airflow in, in a wind tunnel? Anybody takes a guess? A fan, right? <laughs> and a fan actually works by aerodynamic forces. So let me just, uh, uh, so I don't have a fan here, uh, but I do have an example of airplane propellers, which is basically a fan, right? So if you look at an airplane propeller and there is a slow motion of how it works oh, in a relatively humid condition you can actually see the tip vortices without any simulations right so you can actually see uh, the tip vortices uh, the condensation because the tip vortices as we're going to see we are going to study uh, later on that uh, uh, what's happening inside a very strong vortex and it, what it turns out is that uh, the fluid rotates around the vortex and uh, uh, the only force, the only important force that can feed the centripetal force for that rotation is pressure gradient. Okay, as a result, as you spin, right, the pressure outside is normal ambient pressure and the pressure inside has to be low in order for the air to rotate around it. Otherwise, the air is going to just uh, rotate apart, right? So low pressure, as a result, uh, uh, the fluid expands inside and the temperature drops and you therefore have condensations you can visualize. But over here, you can see that all these uh, vortices are also forming a helical structure. Sorry, it doesn't, uh, it's not, uh, it's too dark over here. Uh, but like you can see, it also forms a helical structure. The only difference is that the direction of the lift, right? It is also working through aerodynamic lift. The relative motion between the air and uh, uh, again the the propeller can be seen by the direction of the tip vortices. It's the same thing in a wind tunnel fan, right? Uh, and the only thing different is that the lift direction, instead of uh, pointing downstream, the lift is pointing upstream, right? So that's achieved by perhaps a small difference in the angle of attack of the blades. So the blades actually can work, the propeller can work pretty well as a small wind turbine if you just change the pitch a little bit differently. So. So the lift points this way, uh, therefore it propels the wind, uh, propels the airplane or drives the air downstream, right? And as a result, the uh, the tilt of the lift in this case is going to be in the same direction as the drag, and therefore a propeller, unlike a wind turbine, requires a motor to drive it, right? So this is a, a very excellent uh, use of uh, aerodynamic forces. So, as you can see, what we see usually as aerodynamic thrust is actually a form of aerodynamic lift when you zoom in and look at the details. All right, any other interesting applications? Yes? Race cars. Race cars. Actually, that's a very good uh, example. Let me, uh, let me actually show you some uh, interesting videos of... Uh, of race cars. Uh, I don't know if you can hear it though. Uh, wow, 
Well, D is equal to downforce, and let me ask you later what this downforce is Formula One actually in aerodynamics. Upside down aeroplane. As the air passes over the bodywork, it forces the car into the track. They generate easily more than double their own weight. In theory, they could drive along the ceiling. As air passes underneath the car and the wings, it's forced to accelerate, creating low pressure areas. The higher pressure above creates a downward force, squashing the tyres ever harder into the tarmac for more grip. This downforce comes at the price of drag, which the engineers work very hard to minimise and that maintains a competitive top speed. McLaren have gained an advantage in 2010 by perfecting the F-duct device, which reduces drag and downforce on the straights. The regulations create imaginary boxes where the designers cannot put any bodywork at all, but the areas where they are allowed to work, they really go to town. Most teams run their wind tunnels 24-7 alongside complex computer simulations. The front wings in particular are a work of art, they are critical for the airflow over the whole car, and the devil is in the detail. Let's compare these two Red Bull wings, which their drivers were fighting over at Silverstone. Even the camera mounting positions are optimised for aerodynamic performance. The teams must simulate internal cooling and exhaust airflow. Blown diffusers use hot exhaust gas to speed up the air under the back of the car. The complex bodywork required costs hundreds of thousands of pounds to develop. It's always a balance between corner grip and top speed. The teams have a range of aero packages to select from according to the track layout. Small wings for top speeds required at Monza, maximum wings for twisty tracks like Monaco and Hungary. All right. So as you can see, like designing a race car is essentially designing an airplane. Right, I mean, he was talking about the balancing uh, downforce, which is what? Which is lift, right? So it's aerodynamic force is perpendicular to the direction of relative motion, right? Except for it's turned upside down. Uh, so it's balancing really lift versus drag, okay? And uh, there is no difference, right, between designing an airplane. You are balancing lift and drag. Uh, so the unfortunate thing is that uh, race cars, they have to design really inside a box. So there is uh, not as much degrees of freedom as like designing airplanes. I mean, the, the reason they have to use really uh, like multi-element airfoils is really their effort to squeeze in the maximum aerodynamic lift within a very small space that's uh, enforced by regulation and if you if you look at uh, an aerodynamic simulation of, of a car you can actually see that not just the, the solid surfaces that manipulates the air but also how the air is getting manipulated right and uh, this is actually going to be very important in figuring out how much lift there is or how much any aerodynamic force there is. You have to really uh, understand in terms of how much air is passing through. It's getting manipulated every second. And how much delta V, right, the air gets. And really by multiplying the mass of the air with the delta V, you get the aerodynamic, you get the magnitude of the aerodynamic forces. A any other examples? I heard multiple people interested in rockets, right? And rockets, you usually think of uh, aerodynamic forces as an impediment, right? I mean, it's much better to be able to launch in vacuum. But it's actually not much better to recover a rocket in vacuum, right? So let's see. Uh, so so if, you, if you look at... Uh, so this is uh, one of the landing videos of uh, uh, the Falcon 9 and... Uh, uh, you can see how the grid fins on the rocket is manipulating air. So this is actually when the, uh, the rocket is uh, coming back for landing. And at some point, you can actually see the air that passes the grid fins, right? Now you just uh, look at what's going on at the grid fins. 
and you can see the the a green thing rotates, and the air just gets rotated. The direction of the air gets rotated around it, right? So in this sense, what kind of aerodynamic forces is SpaceX using to steer the rocket towards the landing pad? It's lift again, right? It is lift again, right? By rotating the grid thing, we can see that the direction of, of air is significantly changed into either uh, left or right, right? So that creates the aerodynamic forces necessary to steer uh, the direction and the orientation of the rocket. And of course, the aerodynamic forces are not just important in the recovery, it's actually very important in the launch of a vehicle. And you can usually hear people announcing maximum Q, right, uh, when you are launching uh, a, a rocket. And uh, uh, the reason it is important is because the max Q is associated with the maximum aerodynamic forces. And you really cannot design a rocket that goes into space without knowing how much aerodynamic forces it has to endure, right? Because the entire structure of the rocket is designed to withstand the aerodynamic forces. If you design a rocket that is launching vacuum, uh, the structure is going to be a lot simpler because you don't have to endure all these uh, aerodynamic forces. And the maximum Q usually happens in a, a transonic or low subsonic conditions that usually complicates things a lot because there is no uh, there is no easy theory that can you can use to predict how much forces uh, uh, you get in a transonic or low subsonic conditions and you have to use a computational fluid dynamics which is another topic uh, we are going to uh, exercise during the semester right uh, on some of the Fridays you're going to be learning software some of them are uh, simple software uh, for you to uh, for you to simulate airfoils and uh, um, airplanes under low subsonic conditions, others are for computational fluid dynamics uh, simulations that can simulate a wide range of viscous and uh, compressible flows. All right, and uh, uh, what else? Uh, right, I have another uh, example about helicopters. I think uh, there are people interested in things that go vertically, right? Mm -hmm. So things go vertically. Also, uh, it's a helicopter blade is really no different from a propeller, right? Or uh, if you are losing, if you lost your engine, I mean, uh, like some people may may not know that a helicopter can land uh, with no problem after losing an engine. Okay, so in the case it loses an engine, you can easily tune the helicopter blades to work as a windmill, right? That uh, generates its own rotational torque to sustain the flight. And uh, when the helicopter has an engine power, it works more like a propeller. So uh, so this is actually a, a video that, that visualizes, not computationally, but like using uh, like mist of how the flow field around the helicopter is getting manipulated by the helicopter blades. trying to show uh, a particularly dangerous state in helicopters called the vortex field state and how do you maneuver, uh, maneuver to get out of the vortex field state. But the flow visualization that shows both normal flight and uh, uh, it is getting to vortex field uh, right now and then it is uh, getting out of it is very, very illustrative. Yeah, so this is a, a lot of the things we are going to be doing this semester is to understand and not just intuitively by watching videos of how flows go around uh, bodies that manipulates air,
but uh, to be able to theoretically and empirically understand uh, uh, how that happens. Uh, okay, so so let me uh, let me go into here. Let me ask you a question. How big are the aerodynamic forces? We all know that, uh, uh, for example, lift, right, is equal to a lift coefficient, right, a non-dimensional number lift coefficient times rho v squared times the surface of the lifting surface, right? And uh, the drag is of course, equal to CD, the drag coefficient, another non-dimensional number times rho v squared times the surface area. But I think we, in this class, we don't just want to remember this, right? We just don't want to just memorize this, but really understand the why aerodynamic forces scale like that. Why does it scale like v squared, right? And as a result, the power usually scales like v to the cubed, right? Why is it that? So to understand uh, why aerodynamic forces are proportional to v squared, proportional to density, proportional to the area, the best way to think about it is how much air is going to be set in motion by some aerodynamic surface per second. For example, right, let's just look at a regular airfoil with a chord length of c and uh, a span of b, if we look at such a, a wing. How much air do you think is set in motion per second by the existence of the airfoil? By set in motion, what I mean is that if you take the frame of reference of not the airfoil, which is this flow visualization is trying to look at, right? But if you take the frame of reference of air that's <coughs> upstream of the airfoil, right? The, the air is stationary before the airfoil passes by. But after the airfoil passes by, you can see it is obviously disturbed, right? So how much air is disturbed? by the existence of this airfoil? Or well, how do you estimate? Yes? I guess it would start by taking the product of C, B, and the velocity. Taking the product of C, B, and velocity, right. That's a very good point. So what unit do you get if you take the product C, B, and velocity? Cubic meters per second. Cubic meters per second, all right. Velocity is meters per second. That's the streamwise length of how much the airfoil has traveled, right? And the C and B are the, okay, so, so the B is the spanwise extent of how much the airfoil has uh, traveled through. And C is an interesting thing because if you look at the air, actually air very, very, even very far away is actually disturbed by this airfoil, right? But the closer it is, the more it is disturbed. And uh, we're going to look into uh, more detailed theories when we look at airfoils. But the, uh, if, you, if you set a certain threshold, right, then, uh, then the air that is disturbed more than that threshold is going to be proportional to the chord length. Okay? So if you think about a tube of air that gets disturbed by the traveling through of the airfoil, that volume is going to be so volume, volume of air is going to be equal to the B. It's going to be not equal, but proportional. So let me see. Uh, it's going to be proportional to B times C times velocity times time, right? Velocity times time is going to be the streamwise extent. And therefore, the volume of air per second is just going to be B times C times V, right? Uh, volume per time is going to be, uh, volume per time is going to be B times C times V. And therefore, the mass of air gets disturbed per unit amount, uh, amount of time is going to be what? It's going to be B times C times V times 
the density, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so rho times B C V. And now it comes to the second question. How much delta V does the air get? Wow, well, that answer is complicated, right? The, if you look at uh, the airflow, that's the part that is the most uh, difficult to understand. That you can see that the airflow just behind the airfoil, this is, uh, this is an airfoil with a significant flow separation, right? As a result, the airflow behind the airfoil, that's in the separation zone, was very significantly disturbed. Okay, and one good approximation for this flow field and any flow field with massive separation is that the airflow in the separation zone is going at, uh, um, is practically traveling with the solid body. By practically traveling, what I mean is that the relative velocity between the air in the separation zone and the solid body is much smaller, right? It's several times smaller than the free stream velocity or the velocity of the travel of the solid body. As a result, the air that gets disturbed over here got a delta V of what? Of V itself, exactly, right? So if the air over here travels with the airfoil, right, then in, uh, then any air particle that goes from the free stream gets in uh, in trend over here gets a delta v of almost exactly v, right? So it turns out that this is uh, this is true in the separation zone, but it's also true with a different proportion in regions outside of the separation zone. So in, in the sense that the velocity, the delta v it gets is actually proportional to V. While the proportionality constant depend on how far the air particle is away from the airfoil. Alright, so, so basically we have two things that are proportional to V now. One is how much air is disturbed, right, per unit time, right, that has a uh, V in it. And also how much delta V does the air particle gets, that's also proportional to V. As a result of that, the, uh, the, the um, delta momentum the air gets per second, right, is the product of the mass and the delta V. So if you look at how much delta momentum, right, it gets is going to be proportional to B, C times V times rho times another V, right? So that's basically uh, proportional to rho v squared times b times c, which is uh, b times c is what we usually call the planform area, right, of the wind. Okay, now finally, we get to the critical question, how big is the aerodynamic forces that generated that delta momentum? Right? That question is simply Newton's first law, right? I mean, there is, in that sense, there is no difference between a wing and a rocket, right? A rocket pushes air with brute force, right, at a certain momentum. And an airplane, an aerodynamic surface, manipulates air with much more subtlety, right? But the effect is the same. If I get a delta momentum, uh, if I get a certain delta momentum of the air per second and the aerodynamic forces the solid body gets is exactly that but opposite, right? For example, this airflow, uh, by moving through the air, it gets a bunch of air particles traveling with airfoil, right? So the delta momentum of that airfoil goes forward. And therefore, the aerodynamic forces acting on the airfoil goes backwards, that is drag. For the particles before, uh, uh, above and below the wing, it deflects the air downward, 
right? As a result, the airflow gets a lift upward, right? So this is what sets the magnitude of the uh, aerodynamic forces. So this is uh, uh, exactly that, proportional to rho v squared times bc, both for lift and drag. And the lift coefficient and drag coefficient is simply that proportionality constant. All right. So uh, in the next class, uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, uh, the aerodynamic forces. And uh, in particular, we are going to look into more into vortex dynamics and in understanding exactly, uh, not exactly, but in more detail what these proportionality constants are going to be. All right. So see you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you.